Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here as the designated liberal whipping post on the panel. Uh, every panel needs one, and uh, I'm always happy to be of service to the Federalist Society. Um, let's see. I want to talk about um, the fairness doctrine. I also want to talk about uh, something that I want to call the unfairness doctrine. Um, and I want to introduce the discussion by just talking about fairness for a second. And um, uh, I wanted to uh, relate uh, a story about a great um, late professor of uh, philosophy from Columbia University named Sidney Morgan Besser, who, um, who was sort of the king of the one-liners. Um, and uh, he was subpoenaed for jury duty. And he was in the veneer, the jury pool, and uh, the voir dire process. And the judge said to him, uh, Mr. Morgan Besser, um, this is a case about police brutality. And you know, before we put you on the jury, we want to make sure that you haven't had any experience with the police that was unpleasant or unfair. And he said, well, actually, I, I had one experience with the police that was unpleasant, but it wasn't unfair. And the judge said, well, well what happened? What do you mean? And he said, well, I was going to this uh, civil rights rally in Central Park. These two police officers came up to me and started beating me over the head with billy clubs. So the judge says, well, that's terrible, but why do you say it was unpleasant but it wasn't unfair? And he said, well, when they were beating me on the head, it hurt a lot, so it was unpleasant, but they were doing it to everybody, so it wasn't unfair. Um, uh, and uh, so um, we've got to keep in mind that just because everybody is being treated the same way doesn't necessarily mean uh, that fairness is in play, that there, there can be some objective standards of uh, fairness and justice that we apply to situations uh, even if everybody is being treated unfairly. Now, I want to start with what I want to call the unfairness doctrine in order to bring um, the, f the fairness doctrine into sharper relief. And uh, I will come to explain that I think it was a perfectly understandable, legitimate, valid, and um, ultimately flawed policy, but one that's completely constitutional and one whose values need to be updated and modernized um, to today. But let me start with the unfairness doctrine, which um, we see all around us. A, a fancier name for it uh, that the economists have, of course, is rent-seeking behavior. But essentially, I'm talking about when um, public resources are converted to private use and all of the costs and the risks associated with the resources or the property are socialized, but the profits and the control are privatized. Uh, we've seen a good recent example of this in the trillion dollar plus bailout of the big banks on Wall Street. Uh, another example would be uh, a health care plan that obligates all citizens to purchase private health insurance policies but doesn't control their costs or uh, builds into it um, pharmaceuticals when the pharmaceutical industry has extracted a concession from Congress that the government may not negotiate for prices in free market fashion, may not try to lower the prices of the pharmaceuticals. And all of this, again, is perfectly obvious from an economic perspective. Adam Smith understood it long ago. He said he was, of course, a great champion of the free market and thought that each business acting individually really was part of the invisible hand that would lead to greater productivity in society. But he said nothing scared him more than businesses <coughs> allying together and acting in a collusive fashion against the public interest. Um, and Smith was someone who understood perfectly well that there's a difference between businesses acting as businesses and businesses acting as political actors trying to extract rent and value from the rest of us, which they would certainly do the way that that everybody does in self-seeking fashion unless contained and cabined by law. Now, let's switch over to the Fairness Doctrine, uh, which was created to deal with uh, the, uh, the new um, FCC regulation of the broadcast airwaves. Now, um, everybody knows the story of how the FCC got created in the first place. In fact, it's a rather standard tale of regulation where you have market entities that are competing ferociously and fiercely, um, and essentially everybody cutting everybody's throat, in this case jamming each other's signals, nobody can get through, and the ultimately uh, regulated entities demand that there be regulation in order to sort it all out. And that was the genesis of the Federal Communications Commission, and the FCC established the broadcast spectrum. But of course, there was, from the very beginning, broadcast spectrum scarcity. That is, there was a finite number 
of licenses that would be awarded by the government. If you think about it, this is a very valuable piece <laughs> of public property belonging to all of the people of the country. Um, no single person or corporate entity can just own the airwaves. It's something that belongs uh, to all of us in the first instance, um, which would suggest that really the broadcast airwaves should be auctioned off, that the people should get the full value of them. But of course, that's not what the history has been. Again, in um, a, a legislative context that Adam Smith would have understood is perfectly understandable. Um, so the broadcast licenses were given away. And the notion, influenced very heavily by um, uh, New Deal thinkers and John Dewey and um, philosophers of a public philosophy bent, um, the notion was, well, um, this is a public resource being turned over to private parties. They have a, a double responsibility. And one responsibility is that they have to devote a reasonable portion of their broadcast time to the discussion and consideration of, quote, controversial issues of public importance. In other words, they've got to cover the news and they've got to deal with public uh, debate and dialogue. But if uh, the broadcasters are going to deal with such issues, uh, secondly, they've got to deal with them in a fair and even-handed way to represent the full diversity and pluralism of, uh, of the political spectrum. And um, specifically, the, the, two, um, the two specific policies that were brought into consideration in the Red Lion case were the uh, political editorial rule um, and the political attack rule, personal attack rule. Um, essentially, if you were personally attacked uh, by someone on one of these stations, the FCC's rule said that the FCC had to provide you with a transcript or a tape of the personal attack and you had to be given equal time uh, to respond to the attack. And the political editorial rule was essentially the same. That is, if one of these uh, radio stations holding this extremely uh, uh, precious piece of public property, a broadcast, used its status to endorse one candidate for office you would have the opportunity to respond. Now, I don't see from either a democratic perspective or a free market perspective how any of this is remotely objectionable. And in fact, when it was challenged in the Red Lion case in 1969, the Supreme Court emphatically upheld the constitutionality of the Fairness Doctrine, saying, of course, that it is the right of the audience and the listeners that is paramount when we're dealing with the scarce public resource of the radio airwaves. And the Supreme Court rejected precisely all of the same kinds of constitutional arguments um, that we've just heard and that we're going to hear some more of. And the, the court is saying it's a scarce resource. What could conceivably be wrong with the government conditioning the surrender of uh, this valuable public resource to private parties on their agreement to serve the public interest um, in this way? And of course, um, there are other conditions placed on it, too, which generally um, we don't hear conservatives complaining about. For example, the indecency regulation. And I'd be interested to know whether my fellow panelists also think that that's an outrageous interference with free speech rights, or rather that's upholding the general communal standards of decency, including the, um, the fleeting profanity doctrine, which just got, um, I think it was Bono, fined $600,000 and, uh, and the famous um, wardrobe malfunction rule where somebody got fined a half a million dollars, a million dollars for um, inadvertently exposing the greatly feared female breast for a second uh, uh, on TV. Um, so um, in any event, there, there were a series of, uh, of public regulations uh, put into place. Now, it so happens that because a policy is constitutional and because it's democratically defensible, or even warranted, that doesn't mean it necessarily works very well. And of course, if you think about it, it's a real problem trying to police every radio station in the country to see if they're making political endorsements but not giving the opponent uh, their fair ups to see whether people are being attacked and castigated in the way I think was the suggestion, but not giving a chance to respond. Uh, that's, that's a tough administrative task, and therefore it's kind of a, a clumsy doctrine. But um, the idea that it's somehow pernicious doctrine or evil doctrine or uh, partisan motivated, ideologically motivated, uh, that strikes me as, uh, as a, a notion from outer space. And I think that, uh, you know, I did a little research before this. I don't think anybody is trying to revive uh, 
the fairness doctrine right now. I think that this debate may be a proxy for discussion of a whole bunch of other issues uh, which actually raise the same kinds of value discussion um, which perhaps we, we could be having. For example, the question of net neutrality and whether internet service providers can um, deliberately slow down the transmission um, on the internet of uh, particular uh, websites for either economic or financial reasons or political reasons or ideological or whether in fact the internet needs to remain neutral. That's another question. Another is the question of uh, increasing convergence and monopoly in the media sector. And I suppose we would uh, differ there as well. But my position, I think, uh, is one which stands up most for democracy, most for uh, freedom of expression, most for pluralism, and most for an authentic free market in which certain actors are not able to convert their legitimately won economic power into illegitimate political power. Thanks.